and welcome to the EMS Handoff Podcast. This is David along with my co-host, Bradley Dean. We are your source for all things EMS and we're back to you for another week. And uh, we're going to, you know, very much like a Wake Forest, Tennessee con- arrival. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, Carolina now. Okay. So we're going to have a good conversation tonight. Uh, may or may not have any rivalry between the two. Uh, in the past, but uh, before we get started, I welcome back my co-host Bradley Dean. Bradley, how is uh, North Carolina treating y'all tonight? I'm going to let him keep going because he has. That's that's there all we, we get from Bradley is you know on mute. There we go. <laughs> so, like, so right, I muted because try. I had I had background noise in the street behind me. Ah. Uh, so so I, I'm actually in an alleyway tonight. <laughs> We come to you. You never know what's going to happen on this. It's, Don't it's make great. fun of my paneling in the background if he's in an alleyway. Okay, so yeah. Um, so it, it, actually, it's it's been great. Uh, we, we the storms rolled through earlier, so hopefully it won't interrupt my internet connection tonight. But if so, and the storms come back through, we're going to see Bradley Dean running through the alley trying to find cover. That's great. But I am in the area where we had five drive-by shootings the other night. <laughs> Well, I was, I was going to say, you keep like looking, looking, like, oh, what's good? So, uh, you know, if we have to, you know, we have had random things like uh, trampolines flying down uh, during our episodes before. You never know what's going to happen here. So uh, on that note, so we can remain safe, uh, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get started. So rather we've got some guests tonight. Let's go ahead and get into those uh, introductions so we can get started. All right. So we're we're joined by two uh, great guest tonight. We've got uh, Jim Bozluki. Um, <clears throat> he brings with him over 35 years of sports medicine and athletic training experience. Uh, he's nationally certified and state licensed as an athletic trainer. His experience has crossed uh, most every setting range from college, high schools, physical therapy clinics, uh, physician practices, professional sports, and youth and recreation groups. Uh, he's been recognized as the North Carolina Athletic Trainer of the Year uh, three times in three different settings. Um, And then in 2014, uh, he was the youngest member of the North Carolina Athletic Trainers Hall of Fame. And recently, he was inducted to the Mid-Atlantic Athletic Trainers Association in 2022. And he serves as the most recent past president of the North Carolina um, Athletic Trainers Association. He currently works for Atrium Health as a coordinator of athletic training uh, and an EMT and an athletic trainer for special events department at Atrium Health and works part-time with uh, Cabarrus County EMS. Uh, as an EMT. Um, <clears throat> and we're also joined with uh, with Jeff Henshaw. Uh, I've known Jeff for probably 30 some years, and uh, he's a senior physician assistant in the emergency medicine at Wake Forest University School of Medicine. And I will say that you guys are out, outnumbered tonight because he both, uh, both of us went to Wake Forest for grad school. Uh, I'm just so- going to put this out there now, Bradley. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to call it out. Sorry, Jay Baz. We got to we got to get this in early. So, well, we so, can we can end up making this a whole football episode. Forget about medicine. No need to hand it off. We're just going to go straight uh, football scores this this next week. So, but I, you know, I probably know know Jeff the best. Uh, he comes from a sports medicine undergraduate curriculum and three decades of experience as a as a paramedic. Uh, he does a lot of rescue stuff as well, which is where I originally met him. Uh, he's able to match pre-hospital care, athletic medicine, and hospital-based emergency care topics. Uh, Jeff's been on the medical staff for Wake Forest University Athletics since 2007. Uh, he's a provider in the Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist High School Sports Medicine Outreach Program, and he serves as a deputy medical director um, as a PA for two county EMS agencies, one urban and one rural, and is a member of the North Carolina Office of EMS Sports Medicine Group. So Jim and Jeff, Thank you for joining us, um, and I'm going to turn it back over to, to David so he can kind of get us started with uh, EMS and athletic trainers. So uh, I also uh, welcome you guys to the podcast and uh, looking forward to this. Uh, you know, uh, when we take a look, we both end up in a very common environment rather frequently, uh, and that's the sports field, especially high school sports. Um, my son going into his freshman year of football, we were presented with some statistics that kind of make it interesting. Everybody thinks of the NFL uh, or, or the uh, college level football. 
And uh, really what we see is uh, high school athletics has thousands, hundreds of thousands of athletes. If not, I think it was about 4 million high school athletes uh, in, in football every year. Uh, so there's a rather significant amount of injury. So let's just talk about the athletic training field first, and then we're going to talk about uh, the thoughts between athletic training and EMS and how we can enhance uh, those areas as well. So I'm going to start off with you, Jeff. So tell us about uh, athletic training and what that field is is all about. So I, I'm going to loop in uh, Jim right quick about this as well, because th things are, are, are constantly changing in the education world. And even from, I, I'll date myself, back in the day when I was an undergrad, you could actually be a member of a program, take some classes, do your internship hours, and be able to sit for the board of certification exam for the National Athletic Trainers Association. And over time, that's been grandfathered out. So you're talking about a profession now that has master's and even PhD level providers in this profession to do not only primary care, injury uh, treatment, rehabilitation, and the full scope of medical care uh, for an athlete, whether that be at the high school, collegiate, or the professional level. And J Jim's a classic example of this. He served at so many levels of this, and he can actually comment even the number of programs and things along that lines about how it's changed in the last several years, even since you graduated from East Carolina. It is. The, when I was in school back in the 80s, uh, there were only three curriculum programs that existed. Um, up till probably about five years ago, that had bloomed in North Carolina alone to 23 uh, undergraduate programs. And now that's dropping back down um, to somewhere around the 12 to 14, because the current curriculum mandates are that all entry level people must be master students. So the pendulum has swung and kept increasing on the athletic training side to where all new providers are master's educated uh, providers uh, coming out. And so that certainly has changed a lot of things uh, in terms of supply and demand to a certain degree, um, but it also gives the students a choice when they're going to school because they used to be able to do athletic training and then PA school and then PT school. Now they have to make a choice and pick one of those professions to go into so I think you're going to even see a little bit of less cross-pollination, as Jeff would say, um, where a provider is solely in one silo and not so much trained in multiple silos. And I'm going to follow that up right quick since we're going to make this a dialogue. And it's something that the EMS world is facing already. And we, we talk about this, this job or this profession identity, and we talk about educational requirements in EMS, and I know this has been on the podcast before and been on other things, what's the entry level education requirement EMS? So now then we're taking in our own profession of emergency services, someone who may be certificate trained versus community college. And now then just like what Jim has said, back during the day, I could have gone through a, a bachelor's level program, but now then that person who's walking out the door, who's gonna be hired by our health system, a college or someone else, is gonna be master's degree prepared when they enter the profession. So obviously very highly educated individuals. We're going to get into a couple of uh, points uh, with that here in just a little bit as well. Uh, but let's, let's talk about the arena that we're dealing with when you talk about athletic training. So Jeff, you kind of mentioned there that, you know, most of the people think about college football on the sidelines on a Saturday um, in Southeastern conference. Uh, we're not going to name any specific teams, but they're, Athletic trainers use rather frequently for the uh, flops of the, I mean, uh, the uh, cramps that they have. Uh, but it's not necessarily just Saturday. It's not necessarily just Sunday. Um, we're talking about, you know, seven days a week as these guys are training, as, as these guys are practicing, or, and gals, I should say, um, you know, because we're talking about not just football, we're talking all sports, uh, genders, et cetera. So um, this is rather intense field. It's not just what you see on TV, right? And it's so true. And Jim and I can both talk about this. And we mentioned it when we go do lectures together, speak like at our state uh, injury management conference and things. The public only sees what happens on the field on Friday night at your local high school on Saturday or Sunday. But even at our local high schools, which are one and two A high schools here in our local area, 
the simple fact that athletic trainer is present on campus multiple hours a day, and we've seen a push. It used to be there was no, no type of rehab at most high schools. There was very little medical care at a high school. And in today's world, that, that athletic trainer is there doing rehab, getting that athlete returning to play even faster, and we're doing it in the education building on campus, not going to a clinic in some faraway town or anything else. And I know that in small areas, especially in North Carolina, some of the athletic trainers at the high schools are literally the only health care in that county if it's a rural system. So again, the things that this athletic trainer brings to the table from not only the emergency care side, which we'll focus on here in just a few minutes, but the injury prevention, the rehab, the total health and well-being, looking out for those student athletes, you know, because let's face it, high school football starts tomorrow. I mean, it's been all over social media. Everybody's ready. We're in the middle of a heat wave in the South. And, and that's a bad setup. And you couldn't have timed this podcast any better knowing what happens tomorrow at, at some hour of the morning, most likely, with a humidity of 100% and temperatures approaching over 90 degrees tomorrow. So you can only imagine what's going to happen. And having that athletic trainer there makes such a difference, makes such a difference. It, well, I'm going I'm to – sorry, go ahead, Bradley. No, I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I don't know that people really realize that how many children really participate in sports. I mean, if you've got kids that participate in sports, of, of course, you're, you're aware of, of your kids and maybe some others, but they're, you know, uh, they're like 46.5 million who, uh, who participate in sports across the country. And then when we look at that, one in three of them uh, are injured seriously enough to miss practice or a game. That's 62%. And most of them, most of those injuries occur during practice, not during a game. And those athletic trainers are present for those practices. And Bradley, that's an excellent setup because again, I go back to what you see on a Friday night or what you see on ESPN or some network over the weekend is just three hours of what is going to be multiple, typically anywhere from four to six hours a day. You know, in today's world, you know, most collegiate athletes are limited by the amount of time that they can actually spend practicing or in certain athletic related activities. But still, by the time you put that practice time in, and again, this is where it's so important to have that medical provider there. Not only the game is what's on what's publicly known, but being there behind the scenes, and Jim can comment on that. That that's where really where the rubber meets the road on a lot of this. Yeah, there's a great divide for the most part between professional and, and collegiate athletes and the resources that yes. are provided to them in terms of the number of athletic trainers, physicians, physician assistants, other support staff in the healthcare arena that are there for them almost on a daily basis. You go down to the high school level and you're at a good school if you have one athletic trainer, you're at a great school if they have a second athletic trainer. Um, and so you're taking the same number of athletes, a, a typical uh, number of athletes at a high school in Charlotte is around 400. So you're talking about 400 participants to that one provider, you know, and you're stretching that out over multiple seasons, you know, multiple venues, all those different things are going on at once. And the resources aren't the same, the lower the levels you go. It's the athletic trainer by themselves. So they have to be a one-stop shop and have knowledge in a lot of areas because there's not someone they can turn to on their left and right and say, can you look at this? This is your area of specialty. The athletic trainer a lot of times has to be that jack of all trades in a lot of different uh, areas. And I'll give credit to uh, Doc at our, our high school. My daughter just uh, uh, finished uh, playing sports, but she was in the, the health science programs there as well. And then my son is getting ready to start. And Doc is it. You know, he, he may have somebody come and assist him on occasion, but uh, for him, he's he's at every one of the events. So Using the uh, uh, statistics that uh, Bradley brought up, uh, one of the things we talk about too is the integration then of EMS and athletic training, really the the reason we have uh, this on. So one of the things we take a look at going back to both Jim and Jeff, you know, normally whenever there is a high school competition, there's usually an ambulance on site. So you have your EMS providers. Uh, today with staffing that they, they may be in the area, but they have that. But uh, at all these events, you have those athletic trainers. 
I will bring up kind of some of the negative sides that I have seen and then how we could utilize that to to help with the continuum of care uh, and the coordination of care really uh, between the two sides. So have you guys ever experienced issues as far as a responding EMS crew and athletic trainers? Uh, or, or yourself as athletic trainers. I'll start with Jim first because I've started with Jeff a bunch, and uh, I mainly because I really see this grin that Jeff has. So I think I'll kick it to Jim first, and then and then hand off to Jeff after that. So, so I, I can be a lot more positive, I think, than Jeff um, with, with the interactions I've had with EMS and fire, and I'll, and I'll put them in the same category for the most part because they're responders coming from off campus. That, that don't know the situation or the kid or those kind of things. So they're, they're outside providers coming into the athletic arena to, to provide care. Um, everywhere I have been, I, we have always had a great relationship with at least fire and in a lot of places also EMS. And that went from the university level on down to the high school area. And I've been in three or four different municipalities to where I've dealt with that. And I've always had a great relationship. Now, I know of other places that there have been some arguments. Um, and a lot of it, Jeff and I have done several different talks. Right. Um, a lot of it had to do with protocol differences, or at least language differences between the two groups. Um, and one of the situations I can, I can speak to was in Cary, North Carolina. And it was a heat a stroke type situation where the athletic trainer started what is now common in terms of cool first, transport second. Um, and when EMS arrived, he was in the middle of doing the cooling. And EMS was like, nope, we got to take him. He's ours. You called us, get out of the way. Police were called, all that kind of a thing to where the athletic trainer stood his ground and said, no, we're going to finish this. You can go ahead and start taking vitals and do other steps. But he's not coming out until, you know, our criteria is met. Eventually, the EMS backed off a little bit, but when EMS took the kid, the police spoke to the athletic trainer and told him he was almost arrested for interfering. And I've always used that conversation a lot with every fire and EMS group I've worked with that has to do with kind of patient handoff. I said, well, can you guys explain what statute would that person get arrested in? And I, Jeff and I have asked that question. We went through the office of EMS and said, hey, um, where is this statute that no one knows about that no one can point to? And they, obviously, EMS said, well, there isn't one. It's more of a wives' tale about the reality. It was the closest they can do is say, you're interfering with a government official in the capacity of their duty. Well, in that case, it, it Kerry, the athletic trainer was hired by the exact same people EMS is. So who is in charge of who, of getting in whose way? So there, there is those miscommunications where each one doesn't understand the other role, other protocol, and those kind of things to where that's where a lot of those conflicts go in. But I personally have always been able to preemptively deal with everything and train and work with and meet and get everything ironed out ahead of time. Well, and I've got some follow-on questions for you, but I'm I'm going to go ahead and and hand off to Jeff because I think you bring up some really great points. So, but I want to get Jeff on that before we move forward. And I'm going to leapfrog on to exactly what Jim just said, but and he's right. We we talk about this all the time. He and I teach together, and in fact, we would our we were at our state injury management conference for high school athletic trainers and sports medicine first responders, and we we basically surveyed the audience for lack of a better term. And there, again, one of the most common issues that people face is, as Jim alluded to, it's typically a protocol difference. And the professions really don't understand the other profession. There, there's kind of like, it's not necessarily that we're in a silo, but the fact we don't understand what, you, what each other does. And one thing that you brought up that's kind of interesting, we asked this question about an ambulance. And this is the ever-present loaded question, at least here in North Carolina is you have to have an ambulance present to play a high school, notice I said high school, high school football game. If you surveyed most every person walking down the street and did one of those corner surveys, if you will, across the board, they'd say, yes, it's got to be there for you to play the game. And as you are shaking your head, you're exactly right. There are two sports in the North Carolina High School Athletic Association manual where it is highly recommended 
slash suggested that there be an ambulance. That's football and wrestling, okay? So again, and Jim and I, we were just together two weeks ago. Jim, how many people raised their hands in that full auditorium who said they even had an ambulance on a Friday night anymore? It was less than a quarter, far less than a quarter. Right. So, so not only, David, are we back to the point of that EMS unit may be responding to practice, just like what you and Bradley have said already, it's at the games now. I mean, the games used to be a great public relations event for EMS or fire departments or things. And now then there's just no way. There's just not enough of us to go around. And so I'll brag on my county, Yadkin County, we are extremely blessed to be able to have two high schools and a rescue squad that is proactive to where we can still do that right now. But there are many places where kids are going to play on Thursday and Friday nights and play that high school football, and there's not going to be an ambulance there. And let's not even talk about go down to middle school uh, because oh, right. uh, that that's even and, and if, if you have trainers on site for those even it, it's usually a larger event because uh, not all the time do they have so uh, Jim uh, and, and Jeff you both really kind of uh, brought that up so Jim you you mentioned going to the state office of EMS. And this is actually something we've had a considerable conversation with, um, you know, like third party calls to a person and they're like, well, you call this. So you're our responsibility. Now it's like, I didn't call you, you know, Joe Bob over here did. And Joe Bob has nothing to do with me and I'm answering all your questions. Don't touch me. Well, no, you're, you're my responsibility. Um, so, you know, I think, in, I think, in, you know, we, we kind of talk about, uh, you know, a lot in the education side uh, about the, different uh, authorities uh, uh, on consent, implied consent, express consent, all, all that. Um, and ultimately, there's a perception that we have a legal statute that backs, but if somebody wants to walk out of the back of our ambulance, they have the ability to walk out of the back of our ambulance. Uh, we don't have arrest authorities. We don't have the ability to restrain them, except for if they're harmed to themselves or others. And then usually that's done under our protocols, not a specific statute. Uh, so that actually brings a really great point uh, and kind of going to the next part. So here's the thing. I think the first thing that needs to be said is EMS is there for the best interest of the patient. The athletic trainer is in the best interest of the patient. Now we're talking about more specifically in that acute setting, uh, but, but uh, you know, athletic trainers, as we have discussed, looking at them kind of throughout the week, and this is getting into those injuries, you know, there, there's not many times, like you said, Bradley, 62% of athletes are going to get injured at some point in time. It's it's not if, it's when. So so let's, Jim, this is going to come directly to you with, with those specific things. Because I think you may already have some of this. You said you have a great rela relationship with your universities and high schools if you've done this with. Is that because you have had conversations beforehand? Or somebody that came before you may have had and said, hey, this is what we're here and what we're equipped to do? Or is that just kind of a, a natural fluid thing that's kind of occurred because you've been able to talk to them when they've gotten there? Um, I think when I was in East Carolina as an undergraduate and graduate, um, we had a, a connection. We didn't actually, in my, in my all my years there, we never used an ambulance. We had our own van no lights, none of that kind of stuff, that we transported our own things. And we never had anything super serious in terms of cardiac or those kind of things occur in that sense. Um, but we did a lot of cross training with them because we had a connection there. I think because of that environment of being proactive and doing those things and that the athletic training department is the one that coordinated the medical coverage for the stadium, you know, and helping to make sure EMS was there and, and met those kind of requirements. I took that and everywhere I went, for the most part, I tried to do something. I was most successful at Northwest Cabarrus, which was my one of my more recent assignments. I was there for 10 years, but it was one of those nights where I was there on a JV night by myself and a parent in the stand who happened to be a fire chief now they have a lot of chiefs in this department. His daughter was a cheerleader. And he said, I notice there's nobody here on a JV night. If you'd like, I'll have my bag and my radio. And if you need anything, just let me know. And I kind of turned that in that same conversation to, yeah, there isn't anybody here. How about the fact that we do some cross training with your fire department? And for the past 10 years, I've been training their department on those topics. 
And then that branched from one department to two to three departments to now I also do all the training for EMS in our thing so that when they now learn about what athletic trainers are, our scope of practice, how we work, what tools we have available to us. And then when they show up on scene, there's not that argument. It's usually, hey, Jim, what do you have? And we explain it and we, we cross over and it's more seamless care between it because both sides understand each other and both sides respect each other's abilities. And I, I think uh, I think one of the things that you, so this very much needs to look like, or very similar to that of a, just a normal first response in the community. The athletic trainers are the one that's doing that first response, that EMS or, or even, you know, depending on the severity of first response unit coming to that would take that information and continue on. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like when I taught basic CPR to different areas, I'm like, one of the key things is, is just because we show up, don't stop doing what you're doing. My team's going to integrate with yours and ultimately shift out if, if that's what is needed. You know, when somebody gets done compressing, I'm going to put Bradley in their place. When uh, that, and the person's done breathing, I'm going to put Jeff in, in their place and, and, and cycle out. So I think that is a way to look at that. And I think most effective first response areas is that training between the two agencies. The better that that is, uh, am I wrong in that thinking? No, it is. But in order for that to occur effectively, both sides need to have some understanding of what the skill set is of that other person. If if EMS shows up and the person's a true first responder, is like they came out of the stands to do something and help and stuff like that, you don't know their skill set. If you go into the ED as a EMS provider, you expect and you understand the skill set of the ER nurse, the triage nurse, the the PA, the trauma surgeon. You know what their roles are, and you don't question their knowledge or abilities. You integrate them in your care handoff. And, I, and so I, think, I think that has to do with that look. That reverse yeah. part is that when providers show up on scene they need to do a quick assessment of what is that other provider's level. You know, are you, you know, are you a licensed athletic trainer? Yes. Well, then I should, I should know as a provider that that is a healthcare provider and I should accept what they're saying as useful knowledge to be able to help transition that care. And I, and I think part of this kind of goes into something that we've thought about as well as you all got started. The one thing that you all were talking about is that, you know, at one point in time, the athletic trainer was, and I'm going to kind of really boil this down. You know, you all taped ankles and mm -hmm. gave people ice packs. And that's not the case. I mean, like you said, your master's level uh, educated individuals uh, that are dealing with the basically full range of the entire body and how it operates. Uh, so in many areas, you're probably more well educated than us in Overall aspects of the body. Yeah, certain, uh, certain aspects. Right. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a great, a great relationship to have. You know, I'm thinking of thinking of all the different opportunities that exist because of because of this. So, you know, I, I want to boil down to the the number that Bradley had just a little bit. Yes, 62 percent of the athletes, the 46 and a half million athletes that are out there, um, get injured, but Let's talk about the life threat side of that. That's a really low percentage, right? We're talking more talking musculoskeletal type injuries. You may have some concussions, et cetera. But those life threats that, that are needing the potentially life-saving care are going to be a small percentage of that. Oh, exactly. Because you're going to look at anaphylaxis and asthma, sudden cardiac disease, cervical spine injuries, blunt force trauma to the abdomen in a collision type sport. Then we're going to talk about heat and then the potential for lightning. And then one thing that we think of in the athletic training world that often is not thought about in the EMS world is exertional sickly. Okay. So you have someone who has sickle cell disease who, who suddenly becomes overexerted. And now then suddenly fluids and oxygen is going to make a big difference for that. And David, I want to follow up on one thing from the last uh, little point that we made and talk about respecting of uh, professions and things. Several years ago, and Bradley, I don't know if you made it to this event when we had it at Bridger Fieldhouse at the unit at the football stadium, but we had 60 EMS professionals and we had about 60 high school coaches, athletic trainers, and athletic directors, and we put them all in the same room for three hours. 
And that was literally unheard of about 10 years ago that everybody, as Jim, I, I use my word that he always loves to, to make fun of me with, they, we cross-pollinated. And one of the things during the, that night was we asked, well, how many athletic trainers have put somebody on a backboard? And of the 50 there, like less than half had. But how many EMS providers had done that? And it literally every hand went up. And then we talked about, well, how many EMS providers have taken football equipment off? Virtually none. But how many athletic trainers are versed in that? So we have a wonderful opportunity to meet each other at a very important bridge and to bridge that gap to improve the care of this athlete and improve the knowledge of each other's professions to an, an exponential degree. I, I will say that I, I was actually there, and that was probably one of the best events where I learned more about what athletic trainers could do, what they were you know, educated in, and that was probably – one of the best events I've ever attended to learn about another healthcare profession. That, that's awesome. That, that, that is exactly what you want to have. And it, Bradley, you, we've talked about this before in our rescue worlds. When you step outside of your sandbox and step outside of your comfort zone and intermesh with other professions, everybody just succeeds and everybody benefits in the end. And, and that night, truly, when, when those 120 people left, so much education had occurred so much uh, respect for each other's profession and what each other does for the care of that athlete. That, that was quite an amazing night. That night. Um, now I, I want to go back to something that, that Jim mentioned a while ago. So two events that it's highly recommended that we have an ambulance at uh, one is, you know, high school football games and the other was wrestling. So David, I, I think you've got some personal experience with the wrestling piece of that. So, you know, you want to share a little bit with that? Well, actually, I do. And, and I'm going to go ahead and wave and have him come over here because he decided, I, I told him at dinner that I'm probably going to use him as a, as a prop for this. Uh, so <laughs> my son is getting an impromptu drive into this video. So, uh, you know, just a couple of months ago, he was actually in a high school or sorry, middle school uh, wrestling tournament. Um, and uh this you know, so i'm sitting up my uh uh in the stands uh and i was facebook living and for anybody that wasn't able to be there and uh you know he's wrestling you know the first round is two minutes in duration um and about two-thirds of the way you could tell there was something going on but about two-thirds of the uh way through that first round uh, the, the kid had gotten him on his stomach and uh, he was doing his best to keep him from getting around and getting the points. And uh, after the second time, he uh, he get, was able to get back up to his hands and knees, look back at his coach. And uh, one of the holy grails is don't walk on the mat unless it's your time to wrestle. And the coach bolts out to the middle of the, the mat. The ref's about to go ballistic on him and he points down and he immediately grabs the other kid and pulls him off. Uh, so you could tell something like, there was something dramatic going on. And next thing you know, the athletic trainer comes over um, and uh, there's a couple behind. You can actually hear at the very end of the Facebook live video and asking if I was going down there and I, you know, Hey, they're, they're well-trained individuals. I'm, you know, Hey, let them do their job. And it wasn't until the coach uh, whose face looked about the color of my shirt here, uh, turned around to me and, and motioned for me to come down. Um, and he had gotten kicked in the same eye, the right eye twice with a knee um, and it had substantial swelling. And if you took a look, it actually looked like the eye, the eye was actually about to pop out. And so I think trainer ran over to grab some ice. I took a look and luckily every, the orbit was still in, intact. Um, but uh, I very young athletic trainer and, and she, she turned to me and, and, and said, are you, and I said, and I'm dad and I'm a paramedic. And I think that the, the funniest words come out of her mouth she goes thank god um and uh so ultimately they did not have an ambulance on site we ended up transporting via uh ambulance we called called one on site um and then transported to one hospital and then to our regional trauma center after consultation uh which uh after quite a bit of uh assessment they they actually deemed he was on the verge of needing to have surgery to remove the pressure behind the eye so there was a lot to this um, and a lot of conversation. So the athletic trainer quickly acted. Um, we were able to get the care and, and have the conversation to move on. 
Um, and, and we went through the athletic training world to the EMS world and onto the hospital system. And I think that's, uh, you know, what, where we talked about, uh, Jeff, you kind of mentioned there, one of the big areas or two of the big areas that we really get into is head injuries and heat injuries. So in this case, let's talk about the first, which would be head injuries. So in this case, because of that type of injury, he had the risk of some sort of concussive force, then obviously the, the eye trauma, um, and not only really the primary eye trauma, the, the hit itself, but the build of pressure behind that pressing on the optic nerve and or on the orbit itself. So walk, uh, you know, with, with those statistics or not, not statistics, but those uh, uh, pieces of fact, you know, talk about where you all would come into that and start that process. And what is your mind as far as that transfer potentially to the EMS side and onto the definitive care? Well, I think a lot of it depends on that sideline assessment. Uh, Jim can come on, comment on this as well. You know, we have concussion assessment tools called a SCAT tool um, for sideline concussion assessment tool. Uh, there are other resources that athletic trainers and sports medicine professionals have a, at the ready to be able to assess this. Besides radical thought, touching the patient and actually interviewing them and talking to them, not just plugging in data into a uh, into an app and seeing what the app tells me to do. Um, again, that athletic trainer being there at the moment, again, that is the uh, no better definition of a first responder, David, than could ever be, because you're there when the accident happens. All of us, you know, on the podcast here tonight, most of the time we show up 10 to 12 minutes after the event. So, so things have matriculated, the event has started to grow, or we've started down a pathway, and now then suddenly we have to try to adjust that pathway potentially on what we find or what we see. Whereas that athletic trainer is boom right there and can, and can start that. So with all of these, there's um, whether it be heat, whether it be concussion, again, when we talk about head injuries, of course, assessing for concussive injury. And again, we in EMS have no place in return to play. That is uh, totally on that athletic trainer or that physician level provider on the sideline or on the bench or wherever. And then with heat emergencies, again, just like we talked about, football starts in earnest uh, tomorrow. So, again, preparation and being able to, to take care of that event and be prepared for it should it happen, that, that's paramount for what we have to deal with. Hey, we go back to the old uh, Boy Scout motto thing. We've got to be prepared. and That, that athletic trainer is going to be that to begin with, just like we check our truck off in the morning. We're ready to respond and bring that basic or advanced life support level of care to our, to our citizens. Let's let's talk about the the second one just a little bit more and and probably one of the busiest uh, days I ever had. I, I picked up a uh, overtime assignment at an AAU track and field uh, tournament uh, that was being held in is either July or August uh, in East Tennessee. Um, we were probably pushing ninety five to ninety eight degrees and equivalent in humidity as well. And these kids were out there for. 12, 16 hours running and running, not drinking enough. And I probably started 18 to 20 IVs during that point in time. And uh, that was really when I was introduced to the level. Now, granted, at that, we had athletic trainers, physicians, and EMS personnel. And um, so let's talk heat emergencies. So as athletic trainers, how are you all um, addressing those heat emergencies? And again, kind of that handoff and transition i'm going to toss this one to jim so uh, again that initial treatment and how you all are starting that and the assessment whether they need to go on to the definitive care facility after that absolutely well i mean as with any world that we deal with prevention is our key um we do everything we can to try to prevent them from getting to that point of you know experiencing heat exhaustion heat stroke uh as best we can now no matter what we do things are still gonna potentially happen. So we have to be prepared to initiate those kinds of treatments. And most of us put together our emergency cooling stations, which will be, you know, cooling tubs, ice water, you know, rectal temperature uh, probes, if we have them available to us and those kinds of things. And if we do our assessment of the particular patient and determine that heat stroke is a high possibility or probability in that particular patient, we start the immediate cooling process. Um, that carry incident that I mentioned earlier was the impetus to the state changing its EMS protocol to cool first, transport second. Uh, and now that's just a kind of a given, even though it's not 100% followed across the state, 
but that is what the protocol says. Um, and so when I do my interactions and teachings of fire and EMS, that is one of the biggest things I make sure they understand is that an athletic trainer is going to have the tools available on site. We're going to start the treatment first, then call EMS. Because while EMS is en route, we're already doing the treatment they need. And then by the time EMS arrives, let's assume that's a six to eight minute good response time. We're pretty much done with our treatment. So now we can transition that patient from the cooling tub to EMS care. The biggest thing we have to make sure we do a good job of is sharing the proper information that we had at the beginning so that it goes to the next provider and onto the hospital. Because our one instance that I can think of in the past few years in our own county, the athletic trainer started the cooling process, EMS arrived, did their own assessment, but somehow that information of what the athletic trainer saw ahead of time to what when the EMS provider, EMS provider, when I talked to them after the incident, they said, oh, it wasn't heat. It was a hypothermia situation. The kid was shivering. And I'm thinking, that's not good because it's 95 degrees outside. There's zero reason why anyone should be shivering. Did you not know that they put them in the cold tub and that's why you had him and he goes oh well that makes more sense because we tried to warm him up because he was shivering and I was just kind of shaking my head thinking that's why we do the training you know kind of thing but that had to do with the patient handoff and the wrong not the correct information getting passed along you know in that sense and that's one of the most critical things that the person on scene sees different things than the provider in the hospital and EMS has to be that conduit to get the information that was on the scene to the hospital. No different than a cardiac arrest. You're going to see one thing in the field with various rhythms. You may fix the rhythm. And when they get to the hospital, the doctor doesn't say, what are you talking about? That's a perfect, that's a perfect sinus rhythm. There's nothing wrong with this person. You know, you had to be able to take that information from A to Z and explain what, what you did, why they are the way they are along the way. So I love that example because I, you know, I think we all have these stories, but I had a specific, we had a guy that was running about eight second uh, bouts of VTAC. Uh, I was on the fire side and uh, running first response. I, this guy was perfectly fine when we first saw him. I'm like, dude, what's he's like forties look to be otherwise healthy. Nothing really going on. You could tell you soiled himself there. Like it was, otherwise immaculate house and all this other stuff. And I'm sitting there talking to him and, and normal sinus on the monitor. And next thing you know, I see him turn as pale as the uh, whiteboard on the seventies wood paneling that Jeff has back there. Uh, and, uh, and I hear the monitor just go from beep, beep, dee, 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 and it, it's VTAC. And uh, so we start and get a bunch of stuff going. And EMS gets there. It's like, oh yeah, not emergency. I, you know, he's perfectly healthy. I'm like, here, take a look real quick and you'll see that we're not, it's, oh, you know, that changes that. And so I, I think one of the things that you mentioned there, especially the fact that you all are doing active cooling, most of the time on the ambulance, we, if we do go uh, obviously to an active, we're, we're more of a passive cooling or passive heating. Uh, but if we do, you know, packing very specific areas, the the groin, the armpits, the back of the neck. Um, so if you're you're immersing in a cool tub, uh, you know, most of what we have on the ambulance, especially anymore, is external sensors only for temperature readings. And so uh, you you mentioned in your kit having a rectal probe available for, for temperatures, uh, because that could have given that, that sense that no, you know, they're still probably uh, hyperthermic um, internally, even though they're they're shivering outside. Right. Well, the other thing, though, is that not everyone has that tool. And, and I say, right. you're going to go with the clinical signs and symptoms. So if they're in the environment and they're doing the activity that would lead to it, and they have an altered mental status. And I, for most EMS providers, I kind of pair it along with diabetic issues. You know, it may be a little confused, maybe a little this, and then it, as it progresses, they become more and more combative. And they're not controlling it. There's nothing they can do. Well, if that's what you're seeing clinically in a heat environment, you must assume it's heat stroke and you must treat it if it's heat stroke. And the, you know, the old, let's put ice packs in the armpits and the groin and those kind of ways. Well, that actually isn't an effective cooling method because cold decreases circulation. So therefore it won't actually do it. You're actually putting them in there to kind of do the core body and kind of 
almost shock them into it, but but it's it's a more rapid cooling because what's happening is their organs are cooking and you have to stop that cooking. And if you've got the tool to give you a number, great. If you don't have it, go with clinical signs and symptoms and experience and go ahead and treat it regardless. You can't hurt them other than drowning them. So keep it <laughs> Yeah, keep their head above water. I like, that's, that may be the title of this. Keep their head above water. Uh, uh, well, hey, it's just like cooking pasta, right? You cook right. pasta, you've got them in there. And if you don't, as soon as you take it off, even if you take it out and, and strain it, it's still cooking. Uh, right. You actually you have to introduce something to stop that cooking process. Right. I use my I use my cooking analogy all the time. I'm like, you cook a steak, you leave it on the grill, you take it off the grill and let it rest because it's going to continue to cook. When we're doing it in the cold world, we, we may start at 105, 106 degrees of heat stroke, and we take them out at about 102 because there's going to be some crossover cooling once right. you take them out. And if you don't have a number to work with, you go 10 minutes or shivering, whichever occurs first. And it's important that I, I usually tell it to fire an EMS because we deal with it in athletics, but they're going to deal with it in terms of a firefighter in full turnout gear or a construction worker that they respond to on the thing. You've got most everything you need on a truck with a tarp, ice water, and those kind of things to go ahead and start cooling. Having to spend some time in a cool bath, it will shock your system Thanks. rather quickly. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll bring this up just because it happened. We had a major fire in Forsyth County just today. So re medical rehab uh, for those guys doing suppression work was important. Had a municipal fire department doing training earlier in the week, sent several firefighters to a local hospital with heat illness and everything. So it's not just in the athletic world right. dealing with this. And um, every, every year about this time, Jim and I, we pick at each other. We go on the road with the Jeff and Jim show you know, doing these things and, and trying to educate folks. But uh, part of one of our, our segments is called tubs and tacos. And what it refers to is the cooling tub itself or what can you do to make a taco? And again, is it a body bag? Is it a tarp and things along that line? And it's to show these folks that you may have to improvise a lot of this stuff to make it work. But it's so important, just like what Jim was saying, you've got to start the cooling process immediately to have a good outcome. Can so, we get the cooling tub and a taco? <laughs> not, not. Yeah. Uh, I, I've got. I'm gonna have to share this with a friend of mine who's a physical therapist. Is a big fan of tacos. Yeah. So, can we get the cooling tub and tacos? Taco. All right. Tacos. What about tubs tacos on a Tuesday? There we go. That that brings a whole new meaning to Taco Tuesday, right? There we there, go. So. <laughs> so, so one of the last things that I wanted to, to you know bring up, and probably one of the last points we'll be able to hit tonight is. I know that in North Carolina, we have to do this. Um, and, and that's the emergency action plan. So we take a, basically a timeout and pretty much we pull everybody together and say, if something happens, this is what we're going to do. And we'll review those emergency action plans. Uh, Jim or Jeff, can y'all talk a little bit about, you know, the EAPs and, and what we should be doing at these uh, games? There's, there's two parts to that. Uh, the first that, uh, when the concussion law was signed into um, effect in North Carolina, part of that in required a written EAP be posted at all venues. And so that has a certain amount of information about locations, phone numbers, emergency equipment, personnel, and all those things are kind of prescribed and are must be up, written, and posted at all um, middle school and high school venues. It doesn't cover recreational the law doesn't cover recreational groups, parks and rec, any of those kind of things. A lot of them have adopted it, but it's not required by the statute. And then as another caveat to that, we call it, you know, the medical timeout, the safety timeout, the pregame timeout, whichever way you want to refer to it, um, is a best practice in which you pull together the key personnel, whether that's EMS on site, fire on site, athletic trainers, physicians, head coaches, referees, any of the people that might be involved in that emergency plan at that specific venue and kind of go over the, the mental aspects of what you have on site, access points, how you're going to contact uh, things because you're dealing with two different teams. One obviously is the home team and they know their school and their venue and their routes and their personnel and who has keys to what. Um, the visiting team doesn't know those things always. 
And so, you know, it could be someone you play all the time, but it could be a team you've never played, like a playoff game or something like that, that is totally new to your venue. And so that's just to make sure everyone gets on the same page so that when something does happen, everyone kind of is more seamless in the, okay, here's who we go to for this, or here's who's responsible for what, uh, and who has an AED, who has the splints, who has, where's the cooling tub, you know, all those kind of things. So it's, it puts those people all together if they're on site. And obviously that's a harder thing to do when EMS and, and fire are not on site uh, as becoming more and more commonly uh, these days. But if they are there, they're included in that kind of a discussion before the game. So, so this is a great opportunity to, to seize the moment to before said event, if we can't be there, is if the, the emergency agency can reach out to the high school or whatever else, say, hey, we'd like to meet with you before we have to come down there. That, again, uh, Jim knows this because th there's a character that shows up in all of my lectures at some point in time, and he's a novelist. It's just he sits on the top of a, of a red dog house, and he, he dog fights with the, the Red Baron every once in a while. And Snoopy, when he starts his novels, always says, it was a dark and stormy night. Well, th that's the one we don't want to meet each other for the very first time. So the more that we can do go out and get get some time with each other, uh, that's going to make a big difference. So we know some of this stuff before beforehand. So so I know some other states have started to adopt that. But um, if you're in North Carolina, I think you can look up the Gefeller Waller Act, and mm -hmm. I think that's where that comes from. Yeah, yeah. the 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 requirement is in that legislation, the Gefeller Waller Act. Uh, that's, that's probably about 15 years old now. Um, that was that lays out the concussion management and the concussion rules. But once again, the way that the legislature works in our state, that only applies to public high schools. It does not apply to those other groups, but because it's a best practice, most groups do adopt it. And the thing about it is most every state in the union now has some form of legislative footprint that requires some form of concussion management, injury, uh, sport, or I guess probably the best way to, to say this is a sports safety plan. I, that, that's the, the term I think that is generic enough that will cover not only heat, but cardiac emergencies, because as you've heard Jim mention already before, who has the AED? Who has the football mask equipment removal tools? Where is the tub at or where is the taco at? So we focus a lot and that particular legislative piece focused a lot on concussions because of two catastrophic head injuries that took the lives of two high school football players in North Carolina. So when we say the term sports safety, that is an all encompassing from heat, from lightning, from anaphylaxis to cardiac to, to many other things. Well, I want to thank both Jim and Jeff for uh, coming on tonight. I think there's a ton of great information. Uh, and I think all of our listeners should, uh, dig deeper into exactly what we've talked about tonight. So uh, I'm going to start with Jeff, give you just a couple minutes to any final thoughts that you have uh, about athletic training and EMS partnerships. I think I, I'm going to echo something that Jim and I've already said from the, uh, from the beginning tonight, that the one thing that makes both Jim and I different in this profession is the fact we, again, we, we share respect because of our educations very much parallel each other. And we're a little bit of a unicorn because we, we represent both professions, both pre-hospital care and athletic medicine in this. But if I anything that I could say from an, an emergency services provider, reach out to your high schools to be proactive because the one thing that has been proven time and time again is to meet before and to rehearse. And the same thing could be said for anyone who works at a high school is to be able to say, hey, these guys are going to have to come help us. Maybe we should reach out and tell them where the gate is to the new football practice field, or this is how the gate opens or things along that lines. It really goes both ways, but in today's world, communication is so simple, but yet it just takes one person starting that to be able to move forward. And you've got to have that seed to be able to push it forward. Thank you for that. And uh, your last thoughts, Jim. Well, I think that, the more these two groups or all these different groups kind of interact and, and overlap in terms of scope of practice and, and venues and things like that, the more imperative it is that we work together and train together. Um, I, I've learned a ton working in the EMS field of seeing the different styles and ways they think and how they do it. Uh, the reason why I became an EMT was to learn the language. You know, we were 
two providers speaking two different languages talking about the exact same thing. And so once we learn how to speak each other's language, it made a, a better continuum of care for our student athletes. And like you said at the very beginning, athletic trainer's goal is the best care for the student athlete. EMS, best care for their patient. Well, why not? Why aren't we not working more together uh, to be able to cross train, to be able to help each other out and be truly a champion for our patients? So uh, if somebody wanted to get a hold of the Jim and Jeff show, uh, start with Jim, how, how, do the, how does somebody get a hold of you? Uh, you can get a hold of either Jeff or myself. We have a lot of times people do both of them. Um, I work for Atrium Health, so they can email me uh, is the easiest way, which is my james.bazluki at atriumhealth.org. Uh, and then you, know, Jeff and I will get back to them and stuff like that. But we both get requests to go speak and do different things across the state. Uh, and sometimes you get one of us, sometimes you get the other, and occasionally you'll get both of us. And and maybe if you get them both, you can get a taco and avoid the cold bath. Just saying. <laughs> Well, again, uh, from, from Bradley, myself, and Eric, we'd like to thank you guys for coming on. Uh, excellent episode. A lot of great information here for our uh, listeners to unpack, uh, take back to their communities. Uh, so we just want to thank you guys uh, for, again for coming on. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thanks right. so much. Thanks for the invite. And for all of our listeners out there, we want to make sure and uh, get what you would like to hear. So make sure to subscribe, rate, and view on the gym's uh, platform, but also on our YouTube. Reach out to us uh, through our Facebook group. Uh, and uh, we'll actually be coming out with our uh, handoff media email shortly. Uh, so you can reach out to us there as well. So make sure and let us know what you're thinking because that helps guide us in the future. Don't forget to go to the Pursuit Company to find all of the EMS handoff gear, including our most famous uh, podcast keep back line. Uh, you go to thepursuitco.com, hit shop, scroll down, and you'll see all of the EMS handoff gear. But for Eric, Bradley, and myself, take care, stay safe, and always remember the value of your EMS handoff. <laughs>